North America, lots of snow, but sometimes horrendous lift ticket prices. Europe, a bit more affordable, but sometimes way too dry. If there only were a place that combined the best of both worlds. Well, you guessed it. Today we're taking a deeper look at skiing in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to Japan. So in the first video we compared the western US and Canada to Europe, mainly the Alps. And if you haven't watched this video yet, you might want to check it out first or you can watch it after. This time we'll bring Japan into the mix as well and look at all the same categories again. And there'll also be a few new categories like weather and terrain. So grab yourself a warm cup of sake and let's dive right in. As we've established in the first video, lift ticket prices in North America are anything but cheap. $200 for a day, pretty standard, going all the way up to 300 bucks. So pretty intense. And sure, you'll find some resorts where it's cheaper, but these resorts are usually tiny and you'll still pay more than the average European resort where you pay never more than 75 euros. And on average, I'd say around 60 euros. I've linked the map below and if you hover over the resort, you can see the average price for a day pass. So then, how does Japan do in this regard? Well, normally I'd say somewhat similar to Europe. However, with the yen at a 30-year low, it's basically a steal right now. Day ticket here at Nozawa Onsen, 6,800 yen, so less than $50. And even the bigger resorts aren't really that much more. Day at Hakuba Valley, 8,500 yen. Even less if you just stick to one specific resort in Hakuba. Niseko, the biggest ski resort of Hokkaido, 8,500 yen as well. The only outlier is Ruzutsu with 11,500 yen. As for season passes, they're pretty much all in the same ballpark, whether it's Japan, Europe or Canada, US. Here are a few examples. But for day passes, Japan wins this category without a doubt. As some of you have pointed out in the comment section of the first video, my assessment of the peace signs used throughout different regions of the world may have been somewhat incomplete and that there are ski resorts in Europe that do name their runs, which is a little bit weird because I'm never wrong. I'm never wrong. So here's an updated graphic. Japan is keeping it pretty simple, green, red and black circles. Only in Hakuba I've seen double blacks as well, but those are just ungroomed runs and not as steep as a double black in Whistler, let's say. And as for naming the runs, they do have names here, but they don't post those names like on the slopes like they do in North America. So I think the whole system in North America is still best overall. Was it better, Castbrest Mädelsuppen or this? Castbrest, naturally. Ah, ramen is not good. So when it comes to huts and restaurants in Japan, there's quite a big selection. There are bigger huts, there are smaller huts. Sometimes they're kind of like big halls and they're not super cozy. So you definitely won't find a super cozy hut like you would in Austria. But the food on the other hand, always delicious and really affordable. The other day in Nosawa Onsen, I paid like 14 bucks for my lunch, which was udon and tempura and beer. So yeah, really good. I take that over a schnitzel any day. And yeah, of course, it's personal preference, whether you like pizza and burgers or schnitzel or Japanese food. Maybe Japanese food, it just isn't for you. But in any case, I find it's always very well executed here. There was only one time where I didn't like the food, where it was overpriced and not good. That was in Lotte Arai. But everywhere else, food was always great. And if you just want a quick snack on the go, you can just get a hot drink from one of Japan's many vending machines. Hot coffee and tea in here. Let's do some royal milk tea for just a dollar. Oh, nice and warm. So in the 80s, when Japan's economy was booming, around 800 resorts popped up all over the country. But since then, a lot of ski resorts actually closed and now this number has gone down by half. So we're now around 400 resorts. And yeah, without the injection of new funds, 
we're stuck with the equipment from the 80s as well. This one is called a pizza box, a one-person chair, which you can see occasionally. They are particularly fun in stormy weather. But the most common chairlift you'll find in Japan is a two-person chair, so-called Roman's chair. And yeah, those things are really everywhere. And once in a while you might come across a gondola, but the gondola probably won't be very new either. And because the wrecks aren't really made for fat skis, you usually have to take them inside, which is always a fun Tetris. <laughs> but because it's actually not that crowded here, I don't mind the old chairlifts and gondolas too much. Like, yeah, it's a bit slower often, but whatever. But what's really weird here is just the layout of lifts. It doesn't make any sense to me. I feel like four chairlifts go to the same spot and, you know, not even reach the summit. That could have been done so much better. But yeah, unless we see a second boom, that's probably not going to change. So Japan, unfortunately, I have to put you last when it comes to ski lift infrastructure. So a couple days ago, it was a bluebird pow day here at Nozawa Onsen with about 30 centimeters fresh. And this is what the lineup looked like 10 minutes before the gondola opened. And the rest of the day, I didn't really have to wait in any line at all. You could walk right on kind of like it is now, whether it was the gondola or the chairlift. So yeah, Japan, pretty great when it comes to crowds. Not really that many people here. And if you watch a lot of skiing related Instagram or you're from the US or Canada, you know how crazy the lineups can get over there in places like Whistler or elsewhere. Therefore, gold medal goes to Japan, silver to Europe and the US. No, you don't get a medal at all. Your crowds are fucking crazy. Oh, this will be a fun comment section. And yeah, with the crowds being so little, they don't really have to do a lot of crowd management here. Also, Japanese people are just more respectful in general when it comes to lining up. So even if there would be more people, you'd never get this clusterfuck that you get in Europe. I'd say North America is still the best at crowd management, but they kind of have to be. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to judge the groomers in Japan because there's usually always fresh power on piste anyways, so you don't really see it. But today here in Otteru, they look actually pretty good. Before we look at some new categories as well as discuss the snowfall Japan gets, I know you guys are waiting for that one, let me tell you about today's sponsor Velen, a company that makes dope goggles and sunglasses in a classic style updated with modern technology of which you can win a pair today. So I've been using their products all winter now and I gotta say I'm really happy with the performance of both the sunglasses and the goggles. The goggles come with a tinted mirror lens and when we were in a complete whiteout on Mount Asahi Thanks to the goggles, I could still make out some contours, while without goggles, all I could see was white. I also find that the mirror lens is a great all-rounder, whether it's in sunny conditions or flat light. But of course, you also have the option to swap the lens for a lighter or darker one. As for the sunglasses, I actually haven't been much of a sunglass guy in the past because I felt most major brands have the same generic streamlined look, but I am quite enjoying the retro look of the Valen sunglasses. I think they really managed to strike a good balance between classic and modern as well as performance and style. Polarized lenses are also available which are great for water activities like kayaking, sailing, fishing or beer drinking. Okay, maybe not beer drinking but you'll still look good doing it. So if you want to win a pair of these sexy bees, all you gotta do is leave a comment below, doesn't matter about what, and we'll randomly pick a winner by the end of May. So thank you Valen for sponsoring this video and giving us great vision in any kind of scenery, terrain or weather, which are incidentally our next three categories. Yeah, the reason I didn't include this category in the first video is that especially in North America, the scenery can vary quite a lot. In places like the Rocky Mountains, it might resemble the Alps a lot more with high peaks and rugged terrain. But if you go to places like New Mexico or even Montana, then it might look a lot different. The Alps are a lot more homogeneous in that sense. And another factor that plays a huge role is the tree line. Western Canada and the Alps are roughly the same with the tree line at 2,200 meters. Down in Colorado in the Rockies, it goes over 3,000 meters, which means that higher peaks will still have trees on them. 
In the Japanese Alps, the tree line sits at around 2,900 meters, which also means limited alpine terrain, lots of trees at the top. Here in Hokkaido, the tree line is a lot lower, but so are the mountains usually, with the occasional volcano sticking out. Now, what's cool about Japanese resorts is that quite often you'll be able to see the ocean, like here in Otaru. Good luck finding that in the Alps or the Rocky Mountains. I guess there are only a few places where you can do that, especially Alaska or Norway. Now, because of the high tree line, it's a lot harder to find big mountain or even just steep skiing here in Japan, even though there are a few exceptions. Especially in Hokkaido, expect a lot of low to mid angle tree skiing. So if big mountain and steep skiing is your only objective, then you might be better off in the Alps, the Rockies or BC coastal mountains, just to give a few examples. But if you enjoy tree skiing, pillows and lots of power, then you will have a blast in Japan. And if you want some steeper terrain, you can always hike up a volcano. And speaking of volcanoes, a lot of times ski resorts here are built on them, which means you should pay a little bit attention when you go out of bounds, because you might end up really far away from the base. In the Alps or North America, usually resorts are built along ridge lines, which means you kind of have to actively drop into the next valley to get lost. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I'm just saying be extra careful in Japan when you go out of bounds because it might just take you a really different direction. And just like with the previous categories, it's a little bit hard to generalize, but I do want to point out that if you like skiing in sunny weather, maybe Japan is not the right place for you, especially up here in Hokkaido, where it often snows without end. Honshu gets a little bit more sun, so if you don't like storm riding so much, places like Hakuba or Nosawa Onsen might be more to your liking. But I'll do a separate video where I'll compare those two islands. Today we have some sunshine, but it's actually already late in the season and it's also really windy. So does Japan have the most snow of all ski resorts on the planet? Well, I'm not a hundred percent sure because when you look up a statistic, you might find Mount Baker at the very top. But to be honest, those statistics have to be taken with a grain of salt because here I feel like they don't even measure all the snowfall they get at all the resorts. Like it's actually hard to find data of like fresh snow and all that. And I feel in North America, they're kind of over eager to, you know, account for every snowflake they get. But yeah, I mean, fucking look at it. That's just here in the parking lot. And another thing that's important to consider is that the season in Japan is a lot shorter than in North America or Europe. So if you get 10 or 50 meter of snowfall here, it will be all within two months. Whereas other places, let's take Whistler as an example, they get like 11, 12 meters, but that will be spread out over five months. Which means if you just randomly booked your vacation for January, your chances of finding Pau would be a lot better in Japan than anywhere else in the world. So yeah. Japan, hands down, wins the snow category. So in the first video I mentioned how the off-piste in North America is fully controlled by the mountain by ski patrol, which means in order to go out of bounds, the area will be cleared beforehand and the ropes or gates will be open. In Europe, on the other hand, you carry more of the responsibility yourself. And yeah, actually earlier this season, I've seen someone get buried right next to the chairlift. Now in Japan, on the other hand, it's a little bit all over the place. There are roped off areas and there are gated areas in places like Hakuba or Niseko. And sometimes ski patrol really cares that you don't go in there and they will chase you and take your pass. In other places, it's roped off and it says don't go in there, but just everyone goes in there and ski patrol doesn't give a fuck. The reason for that might be that ski patrol here in Japan is quite often understaffed and they're also often not trained really as well as they are in the Alps or North America. And by putting up ropes and gates, they can avoid liability issues. So it's kind of hard to pick a winner in this category because it really depends on your type of skiing. If you like skiing without a backpack, then you're better in North America. If you're fine taking the responsibility and you have all your avalanche gear, maybe Europe is more for you. And yeah, Japan is just this like weird mix somewhere in between. 
Here at Nozawa Onsen, there's actually a bit of an opera scene with some cool bars right at the bottom of the hill. Mostly though, except for maybe Niseko and a few other places, opera is not really a big thing in Japan. So if your main objective is to just party it up on the mountains, yeah, you just gotta go to the Alps, especially Austria. It's kind of unique what they do for opera there. Therefore, I'm gonna put Japan last when it comes to opera, with North America in the middle. So is Japan the ultimate ski destination that rules them all? Well, sadly, not quite. Is it worth visiting? Fuck yeah. I mean, this country is amazing. Lots of snow, the food is great, it's affordable, people here are really kind and respectful. And yes, there's the language barrier because English isn't really widely spoken here. And good luck deciphering a Japanese food menu. But you know, I think that makes it even more special, more of an adventure to come here and immerse yourself in the culture of this fascinating country. Kanpai. 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 Having thought about it quite a lot since the first comparison video I made a year ago, I gotta say that the Alps in a good snow year are really dope and overall quite unbeatable. I mean, call me biased all you want, but I think the prices in North America are just completely out of control. And even if you get an Epic or I can pass, you'll still be stuck with overpriced lunches, expensive accommodation, and quite often ridiculous lift lines. So even though I do want to explore more resorts in North America and Canada, I'm having a hard time recommending it to anyone based on cost alone. And if you need to plan your vacation far ahead of time, Japan is your best bet to reliably find lots of power. So come to Japan, eat ramen, eat sushi, bathe in an onsen, visit a temple and enjoy a cold Japanese beer after skiing deep pow all day long. Thank you for watching. Until next time, kanpai. Maybe I'll even go for a swim today after skiing. <laughs>